Hi, everybody, and welcome to the RHAP BNB for episode eight of Survivor 45. My name is Mike Bloom, and oh boy, my winner pick going, going, gone. Much like many items we saw at the long overdue return of the Survivor auction. You don't have to hunt through the woods looking for tubes of fun like the contestants that you can find right here on the RHAP. B and B. Of course, let me introduce the uh, the panel for this week, starting with the person who gave me a lot of face when I said tubes of fun. It's Liana Boris. <laughs> Liana, how are you? Like, what's a tube of fun? What would we put in our tubes of fun if we were to create some type of scavenger hunt for our guests? Oh, <laughs> uh, I would put like, ooh, like loose uh, pecans. Maybe some sort Buttons. of like trail mix. Buttons would be nice. <laughs> yeah, that's the B and B. But what do you say, tube of fun? Yeah, the B and B tube of fun is just like what. Uh, actually, it's something that my family calls an "I don't care" package, which we'll send each other. Where it's just like <laughs> garbage we have in our house, not like real garbage, but it's like expired, like painkillers, or you know, just like some random novelty soap that you picked up somewhere that has just been sitting around for years. So uh, ours would just be I don't care packages. I love that idea. That is like yeah. the most representative thing I've heard of your family is, hey, yeah. I found this thing that I don't <laughs> really need. I'm going to ship and spend the money to send to a family member that also will not need it. My sister sent me one. She sent me, okay, I'm going to expose her a little bit. She sent me this, which is like a card that she made when she was a kid. And it says, what am I forgetting written on the outside? And then on the inside, it says, that's it, Easter. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. And it's like got this really creepy face. Oh, oh what happened to her? Uh, where are the <laughs> eyelids? <laughs> I don't know. But it's got individually drawn teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's so creepy so anyway so again representation of my family so now i have some well listen, cards. but anyway let's uh <laughs> unlike the person without eyelids we are not forgetting our guest this time around truly the easter of guests on the b and b because she has returned the rock's been moved from the cave and she's back it's maggie morgan <laughs> she is risen <laughs> amen <laughs> Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to get into this because uh, much like a good auction item, there's an extra layer to this episode. Of course, we have a lot to get into over the course of this hour and a half from the highs of the return of the auction to the lows of the wildest boot perhaps we've experienced since Sabaya this season in Kelly and the subsequent fallout. But the extra layer is the three of us had the distinct pleasure of getting to attend this episode early screening uh there was if you weren't aware on social media there was a fan screening the first of what jeff said he's hoping to do of many events around the country in new york city where they showed the episode they had a bunch of shenanigans ensuing games jeff was there kelly was there it was a really good time so i'm sure we'll sprinkle in our discussion of the event throughout I mean, Maggie, I was going to ask you what your opinions were on Survivor 45 so far, but I do feel like a bit of it is colored by the thing we very recently experienced. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think sometimes with the podcast, because like I was such a fan of all of these shows before I ever joined the podcast, like I and, and now that I get to talk about it all the time on the podcast and you know sometimes I get to know some of the players that have done the show and stuff it, it, it feels a little bit like some of the magic a little bit for me sometimes is a bit like you know it's like if you anything that you're like totally obsessed with if you're obsessed with football and then suddenly you get to go and hang out on the sidelines every game and like talk to the coaches sometimes like you you know it's just not gonna feel like that magic thing as much as it did before but I have to say that sitting where we were and Jeff was like okay pass out the buffs and I got handed a buff wrapped in twine and Jeff was like don't open it yet I felt like a little kid I felt like I was seven years old I was like this is the coolest thing ever I really really had an amazing time Jeff couldn't have been more gracious and lovely he cares so much about the show and that mm -hmm. really really comes through and like he really I think is 
so his passion for Survivor, I think, is the reason that it is such a long lasting show and people love it so much. And it's become such an iconic staple of reality television, like period. And it was just a really, really special, cool experience. Mm -hmm. I think for me, and I can be the biggest hater of like, oh, whatever, it's going to be lame, but I share Maggie's sentiments. It was a very <laughs> cool, even from the like low quality pizza that we ate, like all of it. Just That's the survivor so experience, baby. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it was and my buff. Yeah, buff. <laughs> yes. They had, I got, um, I don't know if it's a temporary tattoo or a sticker, but the try is broken. Why I don't you try it out? Put it on your skin. See what happens. And see if it works. I need some water. But we also got, there were like little bags that had the mm -hmm. logo. Like it was just, I don't know. And it's so corny. And this probably took, you know, maybe five cents to make. But like, I think it was just cool to show, to me, it was more so like the level of passion Mm -hmm. that production and clearly Jeff still have for the community because Absolutely. as people who are members of the community and people who speak about the show and look, am I going to be critical of the twist in the auction? Yeah, probably. We but were like, in the moment. I literally threw my hands up like, <laughs> what are we doing? What is this? What are we doing people? But like, it was still just so fun to know how much they care, right? Mm -hmm. Like it didn't yeah. feel like a disconnect that they genuinely want to try new things. They're trying. They and, and even when there were criticisms, veiled like Jeff had a clear explanation as to why yeah. and it's like okay these decisions are thought through so I think that that was another very cool element to be able to see the behind the scenes and see that passion and that drive coming from production as well as Jeff should I tell the Jeff Probst yes. story that involves you yeah, literally please. have to you, have you literally to. have to yeah listen <laughs> I, I have to do this because this was uh an incredibly <laughs> unique experience in so many ways so if you've seen it on various social media pages, of course, like Rob, and this is such a great representation of just the impact that he has made to Survivor in general, as well as just the medium of talking about this show. None of us would be here certainly without him. Mm -hmm. He was able to sort of MC the night and he started off by introducing Jeff. And so Jeff walks in and this is like, it's an intimate event. There's about 75 of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and this is interesting because I was sitting in the, you know, in the amphitheater with the crowd as well as Maggie. Liana had come in late, so she was standing on the sideline. So you got more of like the third person camera view. It on was it. great. <laughs> so Jeff Probst is sort of like looking around, eyeing the crowd, and he makes eyes with me. And <laughs> let me also say that I have met Jeff Probst before. I've gone out onto set a couple of times. Like he certainly would recognize my face. It was very clear in the moment, God bless him, he did not know my name or know what do I know you from. <laughs> there were other alumni that were there. Again, it might want to be those nightmare situations where like you just can't associate with the name with the face. So what Jeff Probst proceeded to do, again, this is within like three seconds of him walking out <laughs> to rapturous applause, was just stop and point at me. <laughs> and he didn't say anything. He just Mid sentence stopped. Yep. And just <laughs> looked me dead in the eyes and was pointing at me. And you could tell, my God, this is the brain math meme to the greatest extreme. He is trying to piece together every single life event he has had <laughs> in his decades long experience. Is this an alumni that I don't remember? Did I run into this person at an event? It might have been 15 seconds. It felt like 150 seconds because <laughs> eye contact is not broken. The finger is not put down. He is frozen in this pose as he's trying to think things. Meanwhile, my heart drops into my asshole uh, yeah. for, for the first time since like Bruce in the interview I did with him six months ago was like, oh, by the way, you call me a square and I'll remember that. Like, that's the most frightened I've been in the past six months or so. So I just kind of look back at him, eyes <laughs> wide in terror. Like, I don't know how to respond to this eventually the time passes the hourglass is luckily expired and he goes oh okay, never mind we'll get back to that and then he just moved on did not acknowledge it for the rest of the night but i like to say many alumni through the years have tried their best to break jeff probst and i can say i did that successfully somehow in just existing in that space <laughs> congratulations mike
<laughs> watching it from the sidelines was weird because it was like it felt like he was mad at you and even what he said afterwards that was like we'll deal with this later was I think what he said <laughs> like it was like I'm gonna deal with you later I thought he was mad at you for something so but then the fact that like nothing ever came of that I think your explanation is probably more likely but I I turned to Pui at the time I was like oh my god what did Mike do I thought you would like publish something or said some did you call him a square this is Bruce all uh, over again. I mean, listen, Liana, everything you were running through, <laughs> you better believe I was at about 10 times the speed of running through a Rolodex of, oh my God, what did I do? Say, yeah. Yeah. get anywhere near the proximity <laughs> of Jeff Probst. And now this makes sense because when you and I were sitting next to each other at the screening and I uh, blanched a bit at the auction twist, you turned to me, you said, this is why Jeff doesn't like you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was my, yeah, this is why he don't like you. <laughs> because you were critical. And I was like, no wonder he had issues with you. <laughs> well, regardless, uh, I there weren't many issues to be had with this episode, especially, again, I think people who have been to these live events can certainly say and even watch parties that watching Survivor with a crowd is just infectious. Yeah. The energy, mm -hmm. it also, again, felt like a very special night. We'd all been wearing those buffs. You know, we had yeah. just gone through this whole thing with Jeff. I was still coming down from my incredibly anxious high to watch some incredibly other anxious highs over the course of this 90-minute episode, which was just uh, delightful. I would definitely say top three of the season. Now, look, was there a bit of more dedicated time to the auction than maybe I would have liked in retrospect? Sure, were there some decisions made with the auction that I would assign the label of needless like I did last week to? Absolutely. But I just thought this episode, uh, this episode, especially the second half, was on fire with Jeff Probst. And especially, mm -hmm. oh, that tribal council was maybe one of the best of the season. I know Sabaya roasting the idol in the fire only to go out with it in her hot pocket was second to none. But having Jake do all of this is it a performance <laughs> is he legitimately on the verge of exhaustion playing his shot in the dark it not working to kelly's wtf reaction from beginning to end was just top tier maggie mm -hmm. yeah i mean i so i watched this episode twice i watched it with you guys and then i watched it with my roommate who was wearing the buff that jeff gave us when we watched oh. it oh. um and after it was over he was like that was the best episode of the season my friend Danielle texted me, who also is, loves Survivor, and was like, that was my favorite episode of Survivor in years. Like, wow. I think people really, really, really resonated with this episode. And for me, it was a great episode. I completely agree. But for me, I, not to like be the party pooper downer of it, but like, I looked over at Brian Scally about 30 <laughs> minutes into the episode and said, I think your girl's toast. You know, like I, I knew from mm. the way that it was edited. I, I Maybe it's just like I've, I've seen too much Survivor so I can read the edit too much. But I was like, oh, this is, you know, it, I, it felt to me like the classic, you know, Bruce is the big target. And then mm -hmm. before we go to immunity, I'm like, obviously Bruce is going to win. Bruce wins. And then I was like, uh oh, Kelly's been talking mm -hmm. this whole time about how she needs Bruce, but Bruce is her ball and chain and he might be the death of her game. And I was like, dang, that sucks. You know, like, so I will say to me, it was a bit predictable, mm -hmm. but the way that she reacted, you could tell she did not see it coming. And Lincoln and I had a long discussion after the episode about like, what would you do if you were blindsided in that way? Mm. Like, what would your reaction be? And Lincoln said he loved that she wasn't just like, good game, guys. He's like, I hate that, that in this new era, people will get voted out and they'll be like, oh, yeah, good game. All right. All right, everybody. Like, good game because they don't want to seem bitter. And I was like, okay, my feeling on this is if I got voted out, and I felt like I probably should be voted out. Like if I went into the tribal council really nervous and I was like, I'm in a really good spot. If somebody gets me like good move on them, uh -huh. then I, then I would be obviously devastated, but I think I would handle myself. Like, no, I wouldn't say good game, but I would be like, all right, this is the way the cookie crumbles. But if I was in a position sort of like Kelly's or if I was in a position where I was like, guys, we have to do this. Like, you have to vote with me. You have to see this. And then the votes got turned on me. 
Oh my gosh. I would be livid on my way out. If I felt like they legitimately made the wrong choice, not because like I wanted to stay in, but because like strategy wise, it just, it would make so much more sense to keep me and work with me. Like, oh my gosh, I would have been livid. So we had a whole conversation about that. Like the, the big exit and like, how, how would you feel when you leave? Like, I, I, I thought that Kelly's was so raw and like sad when she was, yeah. leaving. it was like Charlie Brown. Yeah. Oh no. It, hanging low. Well, that's the difference though. Cause Charlie Brown, uh, sort of expects the other kids to hate him as morose as that sounds. This is uh -huh. Kelly thinking that she's, uh, I don't know who the most popular kid is because like Lucy's at the top of the food chain, but like she's kind of a bitch. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's almost with that asterisk to it. Isn't she Whoa. like BFFs with Peppermint Patty? No, so that's is she like the other one? Oh, I would say like maybe yeah. Peppermint. You know what? Actually, she thinks she's Snoopy. She thinks that she is the most popular oh. person that like everyone kind of loves. Uh, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden she finds out that she's the Charlie Brown. And I agree with you, Maggie. This is the most visceral I think mm -hmm. I've seen someone eliminated in in quite some time just because she goes through she talked about this with me all five stages of grief yeah. where first you have her hmm you know Will Wonka <laughs> meme turn to <gasps> shock that it's her her turning to Austin doing the Michaela J was it you yes then her turning to Emily mm -hmm. then her standing up and being like what the hell? Which like is partially angry, partially shocked, partially devastated. Mm -hmm. There's a lot contained within there, Liana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think I'm um, also remembering that Kelly, as a result of the tribes that she was on, didn't go to a lot of tribal councils. So mm -hmm. I'm looking back at her voting record and essentially she has two tribal councils, one where everybody piles on Caleb, Caleb plays the shot in the dark, J. Maya goes home. Okay, so nothing, I mean, yeah, unexpected that the shot in the dark works, but there was a clear backup plan, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Then Sifu goes in, yeah, she was on, yes. Then Sifu goes in a five to one vote, completely not a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. Like very theoretically, very straightforward. And so I think that also has to be part of it of like, she just didn't necessarily yeah. have the experience either on either mm -hmm. side, right. Of being yeah. sort of like blindsided. And so then when that actually happens, yeah. like, I'm sure I can imagine, I can put myself in her shoes, how jarring mm -hmm. that situation must be. And I think I would just black out. I have no idea what would happen, but I would not remember doing it. Yeah, she would that. Do she doesn't I'd... either for the record. <laughs> yes, exactly. But that's like, I totally get that. Right. Like that makes so much sense. You just like some other force takes over your body yeah so, exactly you know. what lincoln said liana i was like how would you react he's like i think i would black out he's like i don't i think i would know. see my i would see my name and i would remember nothing <laughs> yeah you just wake come to and like the tribal council said is destroyed jake's cracked in half <laughs> his, his hands he's looking what at am hands. i like, oh, <laughs> i was like oh, oh no God. i would have i would have gotten up and I would have looked at whoever I was most mad at for turning on me. And I would have been like, congratulations, you have my vote. Congratulations on winning. Mm. And I, I mean, I would have gone in if I was in her <laughs> position. I would have been so mad because it was right. Like th what they did was right. But also, like, was it? I, I don't know. I I. I don't know necessarily actually if like this specific Kelly vote is the instance where I would have been like so, so mad, but we're looking at, to me, this is gonna, about to be a pagonging here. And I'm saying, if I'm Kendra sitting here and at this next vote, I'm begging everybody to flip with me. And I'm like, don't you mm -hmm. understand? This is a pagonging. If they voted Kendra, if I'm Kendra, if that's what she does. And if the next vote, everybody votes her out, I would be so mad. I would be like, Katura, enjoy sixth place. Like I would be going in because it's just so frustrating when mm -hmm. people won't listen to you because they feel that they're in proximity to the power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think to your point, I think Kelly was the right move if you are this ironclad seemingly majority now of the four Rebas plus Emily because Kelly really was. I know that Drew described Bruce as the last latch on the door. Really, it was Kelly. Yeah. Just think about the fact that Kelly is in tight with Katora and Kendra. She's obviously, whether she wants to or not, Bruce is number one. It seemed like she was in a friendly enough relationship with Jake before she was like, okay, fine, we'll let him go for the betterment of our games. So I think that this is the, the perfect example of, okay, why are you gunning for this person that's on the bottom? You have to gun for the person that's right in the middle of things. That's what the three amigos attempted by getting mm -hmm. rid of Philip. And so 
I really think this was striking at the keystone of that arch. They'd already yeah. been making inroads with Katora in this episode. Who's to say, like, Kendra did promise them, oh, I want to work with you, even though she wants revenge. Jake and Bruce are just sort of now, like, outlier wild cards, but that makes them the easy next two boots, if necessary, especially now that Jake doesn't have a shot in the dark. And so I think this really was a pitch-perfect plan executed by yeah. freaking Lanky Blanky. Yeah coming through here and uh, making one of the most important moves of the season. But like, here's what's so interesting is that when he first pitches the idea, at least what we see is pushback. And I actually kind of love that because I think one, it speaks to Kelly's strong social relationships. But to mm. me, it also says like, I think that there's, I think there's more intrigue here than just this solid mm. four. Now, you know, who knows? Maybe I'm completely wrong. And this four runs to the end. We see Emily bring up the fact they have to target D. Austin says no. Okay. May maybe it is that straightforward. But there clearly was some disagreement in terms of what the correct move is there. I mean, they do end up going through with the Kelly, the Kelly blind side. But just that initial like pushback shows that there are competing interests and they're not all on the same page of how they want to move forward. And especially as they get closer and closer to the end, that we got to cut someone kind of feeling, you know, might come up like who knows, maybe Jake's like bumbling persona is going to be like the best thing for him because people are just going to be totally non-threatened by him. Pick mm -hmm. up Jake, use him, target one of the other Rebas, and maybe we do see some more movement instead of a complete straightforward paganging, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Let's so talk fun. about, let's do dote upon the auction for a second, because obviously again, took up a big chunk of the episode. It's back, but it's a little bit different. And Jeff sort of couched us on this before the episode aired right at the screening. He talked about how, listen, we're, it's all about dangerous fun. That message might have gone away, but like a monster, it's always lurking in the background. And so the dangerous <laughs> fun version of the auction was yeah. done in three ways, three step process. Step one, hide the money in the jungle in a bunch of little <laughs> tubes. And have okay. I liked that. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I love I loved the Bruce Dodo edit. I loved that. Yeah. I, I liked it as well. And the fact that like, you know, I, I think that it's one of these things, like my overall opinion about the auction is I feel like each one of these three factors, if it was incorporated into the auction would have been fine. I think you put all three of these flavors together and it doesn't work as well. Because uh, I agree. I think mm -hmm. if you do a regular, regular auction and people find random amounts of money, yes, it still is a bit of that random factor that gets thrown in. So it's not like, okay, if it's a running contest, all the strong buff dudes, Jag and Matt style are just going to be able to get the most money. But also at the same time, like it does give value to people who do hustle, unlike someone like Bruce, who took seemingly half an hour to get his tennis shoes on and wound up with one tube. The second step was then this, okay, we are going to, you know, bid on whatever you want. There are no advantages, but the person who has the most money by the time the auction ends will wind up without a vote, which leads to that third item, which is, I have a rock. This rock has a number on it. And though the auction will stop at any time. And it was a little bit of a confusing explanation. We were sitting there like, okay, what's going on with the rock? Oh, it just means the auction could stop at any time, like any other auction that has existed in the history of Survivor. Yes, but there's a rock, <laughs> which is dangerous fun. I think the idea is that like it's not pre-planned, right? So nobody can yeah. claim foul play or anything when it's like, oh, you stopped it right before I like, oh no, it's on the rock. Um, I for me, I agree with Maggie. I didn't mind the tube search. I thought that that was cute. That was fun. I think my my actually, and I don't even mind the rock all that much either. I think the biggest issue is the person with the most amount most amount of money at the end loses their vote. I get why they did that. And part of that was because of Jeff's explanation. And it couples with the fact that they didn't have any advantages. So I think what they didn't want is they didn't want people to hold on to their money. They were like, spend yeah, your yeah. goddamn money, spend your yeah. money. We're going to do this in two ways. We're going to say there's no advantages. We're going to tell you outright there's no advantages. So don't be keeping yep. your money. And two, the whole vote thing. So that was clearly the intent behind it. But just ultimately what ended up happening was once you got closer to the end, people just bid all their money. And then the person with the top amount of money got the, the item. So that part was like not yeah. particularly fun. So again, I understand the logic behind it, but I think in the actual execution, it just didn't exactly work the way that sure. uh, it, it would have been good, I think. That's the thing is that I feel like the first five or six items were really fun because you do have people going back and forth. 
Then mm -hmm. it kind of turned from a survivor auction to a survivor catalog where it's like, yeah. oh, okay, I want this thing. Let me spend all my money on it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not to say that that hasn't happened in auctions beforehand, but there was still a little bit of tension, I feel like, as to, okay, will I get the item I want? Not, oh my God, will there be... S it doesn't even need to be good or bad. Is there another random object that's still in play that I can spend all my money on so that I lose a vote? And mm -hmm. this was something that... I don't know. I, I'm of a couple minds as to like how consequential was this for Kelly's boot? Because a lot of people have been talking about if Bruce still had his vote, A, maybe he doesn't gun for immunity as hard as he does. And B, this means the Bellows could have five votes if they want to force a 5-5 five, five tie. I'm not sure if Bruce did have his vote, how much they would want to go forward with that. Because we it just saw Katora didn't want to go to Rocks last episode. Hmm. I don't think she's going to Rocks this episode. Yeah. No, I don't think that that ever would have happened. And I actually think that, like, after we watched the episode, the first thing I said maybe to you, Mike, was, like, the failure of the Bellows is their failure to work together. Like, they're mm -hmm. going to be just, like, completely wrecked because they're such in such disarray and, like, they can't work together. And, like, that is really, like, I, th I think um, – I, I, I can't remember who I was listening to talk about. I listened to all the podcasts this week and I can't remember who was talking about it, but somebody was that like they didn't realize how serious they were about the initial tribal lines because those were yeah. only like six days together that they yeah. spent. So they didn't mm -hmm. under like they didn't realize that like the the four, the road row two, is that what they're what are they? Uh, what are Reba? Reba. 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 I was going to say, like, <laughs> hey, were you uh, signing an example from Survivor no, History, Maggie No, Morgan? gosh. Red. For the four reds. Yeah. yeah um, color, yeah. <laughs> the four reds are, um, like, that they would How stick together so hard. Yeah. And I yeah. and I agree. But I think that it's it's really interesting because the culture of this season is not that fast-paced culture that we've seen from about, like, Survivor 37 on. You know? like Yeah. And mm -hmm. that, I think, Lincoln said that that was – it, that's his favorite part about the season is that this feels a little more old school and it's not mm -hmm. just like every single episode you're like well wait I thought that this person was your number one last episode and now you're pushing for them to go like what is going on here and I think that that it, it makes a more straightforward story and that combined with the 90 minute episodes I think makes is, is what's making the season really successful well let's look at Reba slash Road 2 versus Bello in their primer Sorry. trajectory because I think they actually had two different paths to mm -hmm. this mergatory state bello has pretty much all been together since the beginning you know kendra and brando mm -hmm. ended up staying on bello but otherwise you have this foursome that has been together occupying the same space since day one and there's so much built up pressure from the mm -hmm. fact that they didn't vote together either and kelly and brando have both kind of confirmed like yeah if we went to tribal council literally any time in the pre-merge if we lost one challenge bruce is gone that's mm -hmm. it game over and i think there's mm -hmm. a lot of again stress and anxiety built up from that reba has this ironclad four who conveniently enough divided up into mm -hmm. pairs so they had a little bit of that time to separate to sort of long for each other while also making inroads with other people austin mm -hmm. and drew connecting with emily in retrospect might be the best move that's been made yeah. in the game so mm -hmm. far because that is a something that has had her relying on them and vice versa for every single vote mm -hmm. so far. And so I think it's interesting that just due to, I guess, random chance and a series of immunity wins, Bello arguably wound up in a worse spot because those bonds were not yeah. nearly as tested as the Rebus were. Yeah. Hmm. I think also, yeah, but I don't know. I think then you could also say, okay, well, even though I guess they were split up that they had to, so you're saying like they were split up. So they had to like go fight their own battles and then they missed each other instead of uh, yeah, just like or, continuing or, or, to target Bruce. Cause it felt like it's still like, well, we still don't really know about Sifu and J Maya. Yeah. But I also feel like, yes, they did take shots at Sifu and J Maya, but like they were locked in with each other. And they also had some other mm -hmm. stuff where like they shared the idol information with the, with themselves. So it was clear that like they were yeah. a much stronger group than the bellows were but i do i do think what certainly helped was that they kind of like divided and conquered as well because now they could come back together as four and be like okay i made this connection with emily okay i made this connection with jay maya and now we can sort of work together with those numbers as well yeah i guess so i just feel like those four just clicked and like they were like okay we're working together we're bonded by this idol thing like let's do this a group of four i think also the there was a little bit um 
it like it wasn't as clear a group on Bello because it was like, well, Jake still kind of wants to work with Bruce. So then Br- they're not going to be pulled in. And then you have Kelly and Brando who are still in the middle. So I just yeah. feel like their dynamics were just overall a lot shakier than the Reba four that like just clearly locked in early. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's like Kelly said a little bit at the event that she felt like she was hurting cats kind of yeah. with like yeah. her, her people and that, and, and maybe that's why I'm like, I would have been so mad if I was in her position because it, it really felt that way sort of from the audience perspective of like, these yep. people just can't get it together and like yeah. understand that strategically we really, really need each other. And like, suddenly I am the person who's going home, even though I'm the person who was willing to work with everybody, like because I was the best strategic force and you guys all dropped the ball. Now it's my head that's on the chopping block. And like, again, I completely think that if, if we're looking at it from the red tribe and Emily's perspective, Kelly, 1000% was the move. That's why 30 minutes in, I was like, she's gone because she's yeah. clearly the one with her head screwed on straight out of all of these people. But I just like relate, like, or maybe I just really empathize with that idea that like, if you get a, a bad draw and the people that you, you're supposed to be working with are a mess, like, what can you do about that? Like, if you're running out of options, you know, like that yeah. sucks. I don't know though. I look at the re before and I say, okay, well, what if D had been like, let's use D as an example here. Okay. Let's say D had been like, no, we really need to keep J Maya. No, we really need to keep Sifu and wasn't willing to let them go. Like, mm-hmm. I think that that's the decision. Like Kelly should have been, instead of trying to keep these cats together, maybe should have been like, yeah, let him go. Like it's only causing dissension. It's only getting worse. There's no yeah. way we're going to be able to do this anyway. We need to remove the quote unquote bad apple from the group in order to move forward because that's what yeah. Rima did. They got rid of Sifu. They are, were willing willing to let him go. They were willing right. to let Jemaya go. They were like, look, for us to be strong for together, we need to let these guys go. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if like we're seeing those two decisions being made, mm. obviously opposite decisions, but they're being told almost like side by side. And I think that that's also yeah. what's really cool about yeah. this season is that you, there are so many parallels that you can see mm-hmm. different decisions and how that's ultimately impacting the players' outcomes. And that was Kelly's narrative was like, Oh, I'm working in between. I have to make a decision. Like I'm, I'm in the middle, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. Right. And then that's ultimately what ends up doing her in. So it's very interesting from a narrative perspective. And I think we get a lot of that, especially because of the 90 minute episodes as well. We can really expand on that story. Yeah. That's such an interesting point that I didn't even think about. Cause I'm thinking like this episode specifically, it's like everybody come together. What are you doing? But like, Mm -hmm. that that's something that happens in big brother a lot is like when knowing when and when not to like what hill to die on is so important in order to keep an alliance together. And like, if it's a situation where there are two targets and your ally really, really, really wants, like if I'm working with Liana and it's between Mike and Rob and Liana, you are like, we have to get out Rob first. And I kind of want Mike out first, but like, whatever I'm like, okay. Like, and and I let you have that, you know, like that's the type of stuff that like, you're right bonds people together in a way but it's also like i want to keep somebody who's always an ally for me yeah, over somebody exactly. who i don't even know you know so it ah, it's like a <laughs> exactly and that's what makes it so tough for her right is because yeah. she's because there isn't that solid four she doesn't have like the solid four necessarily uh-huh. that she can go yeah. back to she already lost brando so now it's like okay how tight is she with katura how tight is she with kendra so and like i under i'm not saying that inherently she made the wrong decision i absolutely see her line of logic and i'm sure if i were in her position i would be absolutely pushing for the same thing uh it's just um that's what makes the game so cool and so fun yeah (laughs) yeah and it's it's so interesting as well just because kelly was now granted i'm I'm sure there are other podcasts that we'll get into you know the path that led her to this but it was a little bit of guilt by association as well and she Mm -hmm. called it as much as you did maggie of like bruce won immunity great it's probably going to be me or jake because bruce has been (laughs) running to jeff probes himself and saying that kelly is is his number one and so Uh if you can't take a shot at bruce you might as well take a shot at me what Mm -hmm. i do find so interesting though you bring up the big brother aspect is this idea of dogpiling is the fact Mm -hmm. that the J Maya vote, even the Caleb one that came before it with the shot in the dark play. Sifu was a bit of a pile on as well. Obviously, they mm-hmm. thought the Bellows did that it was going to be a pile on with Jake. Jake is going to make one of many impassioned pleas at Tribal Council about how, you know, if you're all dogpiling onto one person, the fact of the matter is someone else is right above me on yes. the bottom, getting just as squished as me. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a little bit of a play on one of my least favorite tropes in a reality show, which is like people calling out others being like, you're not playing the game, which is more so coded for like, you're not making the move I want you to make. At the same time, it is really interesting. And I think this Kelly blindside is such an interesting vote from so many ways. And the only reason why it's so divided is because had Bruce lost immunity, it would have been yet another dog pile vote. Is there? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. So, no, it's just like, I see, and this is frustrating to me, like to, to think about in her position, because it's like, okay, so if Bruce, like if I'm trying to work with D, I'm trying to work with these Rebus, these red, this red tribe, and I'm like, okay, so the dog pile vote is on my people, like it, it's on mm-hmm. Bruce, but now that we can't have Bruce, it's on Jake, like what that you know, and but I guess you're right, Liana, bringing up but like, well, when it was Caleb, it was Jemiah, it was one of their people. But it's like, mm. you just have to really look at the numbers. You just have to look at the numbers and be like, who are my solid numbers? I cannot lose. Like, we are five and five right now. And I think the problem was she just didn't see it that way. And mm-hmm. I, I think mm-hmm. that like, that is the the big problem with this new era of survivors it's so fluid that you don't see the numbers you go from vote to vote to vote it's like the voting blocks thing and you go from vote to vote to vote and you're like well all we need are the numbers for this vote then like i don't care what the numbers are for the next vote but no you you do like you need numbers this is a game of numbers and i i'm sorry but like the idea that Bruce would be the pylon vote, but now Bruce is gone. So we're going to pile. Oh, so we're going to pile on Caleb, who's a neutral party between our two people. And then we're going to, yeah, of course, the Jimmy, Jimmy thing happened. The the divide happened, which also I think is a really hard situation to point out. But then like, so we piled on neutral Caleb. Then we are going to pile on Bruce. And then we're going to pile on Jay. Like, to me, the writing's on the wall. And maybe it's for Kelly, you know, she's like, for Kelly, it's too late. But for somebody like Katora, she, I need Katora to come into this episode and be like, so I'm six. Like, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm i sorry. Mm-hmm. If, if, if that's not the way you're looking at it, like, something's got to change here. Like, look at the pylons here. Like, look at the people who are getting piled on and, and figure it out. And I look forward to Katura having a wonderful confessional where she's talking about how to make herself not six because I, I believe in her. Um, but like, yeah, that's, I, I, it was just really frustrating for me to watch and be like, oh, they don't see it. And, and they're too blinded by their own distaste for these people that annoy them you know yes which i love Mm -hmm. i love Uh, emotion on survivor this is why we come to the game (laughs) yeah well let's get into the woman of the hour and a half we've talked about her a lot and she was quite a popular pick to go far if not take it all in the end but let's break down how we thought kelly would do in the pre-season Mine is fairly obvious, uh, as I was quite literally wearing on my sleeve in my interview with her earlier this week. But Liana, I'm curious, from your perspective, how did you think Kelly was going to do? Okay, so I have Kelly as making the jury. And I said that Kelly is built for the game of Survivor. She's physically strong, has an amazing social game, and has the ability to stay calm under pressure. However, this is exactly why she was a target right before the finale as she failed to manage her own threat level. I also said in the pre-merge, Kelly was running Bella with her right-hand woman, Katura, just like Katniss and Peeta. (laughs) But the capital, a.k.a. Reba, and remaining (laughs) Lulu set B-swarm after (laughs) B-swarm at Bella until Kelly was the only one left. So oh, it's like, yeah, the track is a tracker jacket the tracker reference. Jacket. <laughs> so <laughs> I, re- I read the books a long time ago, but I remember she said in her, who would she want to come visit in the questions that you asked, Mike? I think yeah. she said Katniss. So that was where also, came from. Also, how timely the Hunger Games movie came out this week. I know, I know, right? The new Hunger Games movie, yeah. Ballad of songs and snakes and rats. Uh huh. <laughs> and then, okay, the last thing I wrote was despite losing her vote due to a shipwheel island visit, uh-huh. Her ally was Katura and her enemy was D. Wait, so you, like, do you, was that the start of the sentence? Despite losing her vote, her ally I was literally there? have. <laughs> I have. Despite losing her vote due to Shipwheel Island visit, comma. Nothing. <laughs> I didn't finish. I didn't finish writing it, apparently. What are you, Jake? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I pulled a, I pulled a, whoa, sorry. Whoa. <laughs> well, hold on. I, I got, I got to pull the room here. Cause Maggie, you are a performer by mm-hmm. trade. How much of this Jake shenanigans at tribal council was him actually like simulating brain fog versus like him actually putting forward a, a performance? He was putting forward a performance. Come on. He's good. He also posted on Twitter, like, last week, a photo of him doing theater in high school. Like, Jake knows what he's doing. He's good. And, like, he's good enough that when we were sitting there watching him brain fog, everybody was like, this is really uncomfortable. Like, is he okay? But the second that he was like, my idol, oh, sorry, blah, blah, I was like, okay, all right. The jig is up, Jake. The jig is up. You so know? <laughs> good. Uh, though I think, and you know, you wonder in the moment, okay, was that convincing? I don't know if any of you watched the secret scenes this week, but there was one that actually might have had Jake giving up the ghost before he attempted that move, which is Jake was idle searching with Bruce and he says, Watch this. And he goes, Yeah, baby. Uh, to yell loud enough that people at camp would be like, Oh my god, what happened? And so it was like Kelly and Dee and Julie initially do kind of like crap their pants. Like they look like Mm -hmm. me when Jeff Probst pointed at me for a length and period of time. I was like, oh, oh no. But then once Kelly approached him and she thought through it, she's like, wait, but he wouldn't yell to the high heavens if he found an idol. He would want to keep it secret to play a tribal. So no, I'm calling you on your bluff. And I maybe that sort of compounded the fact that they didn't really think that Jake had an idol. If anything, they think his shot in the dark play was happening. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i i thought it was fun i i do think that the like the tough thing okay if people buy it right let's say people buy it then if he does get to the end he has to like do that whole pull off the mask reveal thing mm-hmm. which i think is actually quite challenging if they don't buy it they're gonna be like this idiot with his like play so like i just feel like it could go poorly either way <laughs> whether or not they believe him or not i don't know it's, i'm it's nervous for, for buddy TV, though <laughs> oh it's yeah fun so fun TV. TV. oh so mm-hmm. fun and i'm 100%. really happy that he's doing it <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> i the whoa sorry whoa is one of my favorite reactions <laughs> because also this is the rare survivor instance where a person is blindsided by staying which is we get so again once in a lifetime maybe twice in survivor and so to have not only that happen to jake for arguably in another instance he'd be like oh look at what i was able to do you thought i was going but i was the one with the final term but no he gets caught completely flat-footed waves his shot in the dark and then responds by going whoa sorry whoa (laughs) <laughs> as if like he didn't he didn't want to offend kelly it's giving it's sorry yeah. it's giving big meech when bridget got voted out and big meech was like you all suck i hate you goodbye and, and then bridget got voted out and she starts sobbing and she's like i thought i was going home like it's it's giving that in survivor form <laughs> yeah it's the second woe for me that like really yeah. does it because yeah, i don't I know why he felt whole... he, had, he had to do a, give a different reading of the line <laughs> Yeah, because it was because I get that you're just like whoa, like you're so shy, and then you realize like oh no, I'm sorry, like you're going, but then what is whoa, whoa, sorry, whoa, <laughs> that's so good. Now Jeff's like, can we get multiple reads of it, Jake? Uh, I'm just want to yeah. get a, a whole range of emotions from you. <laughs> okay, now you're sad. Now you're angry. Oh my gosh. So good. Uh, but I'm surprised Jake didn't say line, considering all the brain fog he was going through at that point. So uh, I had Kelly first boot like did not have high aspects for her mm. no of course i had her taking yeah. it all i i put my money where my lack of mouth was or too much mouth i should say not enough money that's bruce in a nutshell isn't it uh, i had her as my winner i said that kelly's charisma and easygoing nature quickly makes her the safest person on Bello, as she's in the mix on every single alliance Despite her insistence in my interview that she's, quote, on a break from her job, she will tend to one of her tribe mates when they struggle with the elements. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said that she'll go on a journey that allows her to make a cross-tribal alliance, something that carries her through the first couple of mergatory slash post-merge votes. Uh, She does become the immunity queen of the the season. She wins three necklaces total. Unfortunately, at one point, the non-bellows connect the dots and realize Kelly is the biggest threat, bringing the numbers against her. Fortunately, she's able to get a bellow to play an idol on her, saving her a la her idol, Kelly Wentworth. Unfortunately, it comes at the, cl- the cost of her close ally, Kendra. After that, Kelly fades into the background as the bellows take control. She hitches herself to the wagons of the louder Bruce and Jake, 
And though fans feel like she's playing a losing game in the process, getting to final tribal council, she dissects her strategy and intention with the precision of injecting someone. As a result, she walks away with a decisive victory. After saying she's the first lesbian survivor winner, one of the previous winners will soft launch their own sexual reawakening, stealing Kelly's thunder. Uh, and I said her closest ally was Kendra and her enemy was nobody. That's kind of the point. <laughs> well, whoa. To, to some whoa. of that, you are maybe a psychic. Um... <laughs> but in like, often the worst ways where I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm basically at the other path in the final destination scenario. The other yeah. timeline where Bruce does use the idol on Kelly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So interesting. Wow. That was, you guys, honestly, though, you both had like really good reads. Like a lot of what you said was true about her game. It's just, she just got unlucky here. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, unlucky plus, you know, some strategic errors, but I think that, you know, if Bruce hadn't won that immunity necklace, she would have been fine. But mm -hmm. then I don't know about the rest of the time, you know, for Pagonging. I don't, it's, it's really hard for me to watch players and know what they should be doing mm. and feel like they're not doing it. That's like a, it's a frustrating mm -hmm. thing as a viewer. So that, I think that's maybe where all my energy is coming in about like, ah, what are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. But we'll see. Next up. Yeah. It's, I think it's so tough to like to be in that situation to make those decisions and you're mm -hmm. operating with, you know, only your information. And 1, so I think, yeah, I, I, I think, I think again, she's someone who is such a, is, is a good player. And I think mm -hmm. if she were to come back on another season, I think that she would take everything that she learned from this experience and only excel further. So mm -hmm. and she's just got the ingredients for it, right? There's some people you just can't teach to yep. be like, mm -hmm. they just, she, her starting set is already so high in terms of her mm -hmm. skills. So I'm, I, and like, yeah, she, and she was so good at the event too. And we got to hear yeah. from her mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, just very personable, very fun. I mean, I mm -hmm. love this. I think, I mean, I don't love it because again, I love her and I, I loved her as my winner pick. But the closest thing I could really think in terms of, oh my God, I thought she was a front runner to win from an edit perspective, from a gameplay perspective. I think all the way back to Jeremy in San Juan del Sor, where it felt like in so many ways, Jeremy was like a main narrator. He felt yep. like he was giving a lot of strategic background, but also a bit of personality as well. Good in the challenges, had good relationships. And then like second third vote after the merge snap she gets her legs cut out from under her in like a huge cutthroat important move and so yeah. i i give massive respect to the players and look should there and be a returning player in the in the season in the future we know how it went for jeremy and maybe that's also where like my passion is coming in because i'm like she's so good like how could you take her out this early like it, it shouldn't have happened this way you know i'm like i'm frustrated for her i'm frustrated about the moves i'm fr you know what i mean i'm just like no this isn't how the story was supposed to end you know and maybe that's where my passion is coming in <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I, it's again, it's definitely the right move from the Rebas, I think. Yeah. For sure, because mm -hmm. now we have this fractured group of Bellas, but it is tough as a viewer. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's get into something a bit more palatable, something a bit tastier. It's our game mm -hmm. for this week. Now, again, the Survivor Auction returned for the first time in 15 seasons. Eight and a half years was the last time we did yeah. this. Think about where you were eight and a half years ago. All those dreams you've had. All those prospects. That's where you are now. It never came true. <laughs> I don't know. They could have. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know Puya then. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. The last time it happened, an auction happened was in a pre-Puya world. Oh. I couldn't even drink. I was 20. <laughs> oh. oh, it's the same oh. level. <laughs> we were both able to find the loves of your life respectively. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> well, we're going to take a bit of a dash through Survivor history here as I asked the uh, social media populace to provide me with some of the most top tier moments from Survivor auctions from seasons past. And so we are going to revisit them and we're going to pit them against each other. We're going to do a tournament, a bracket, if you will. It's March somewhere, I suppose, to break down what we think is the best auction moment 
in Survivor history. Now, I'm excited about this because we do have, I think, among our panel, a nice representation of Survivor fandom as well. So it's not just deeply dug, well, this was important because of this character and what they represented. I think we'll be able to also talk about, like, from an objective standpoint, how do these TV moments pop? I guess... Mm -hmm. Even before we get into it, though, Liana, is there anything from this auction that should we do another go round from this you think should be in the conversation for this list? I mean, I am just trying to block out the whole fish eyeball of it all. <laughs> like everything about it, I'm trying to just it, we talked about blacking out when you get voted <gasps> out. This is the, the I want to black out that like especially. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, it was so gross. Even just thinking about it, I'm so grossed out. And when he bit into it and the goo is just like, ah, okay. That's so gross. I love that they so took cool. an entire commercial break on that. Like, will Austin bite the eye? <laughs> <laughs> Horrifying. So gross. Awful. Horrifying. Awful. Ugh. I, I would actually, I would probably put Emily's complete change of character in there as well. Now, maybe that's a mm. bit more in context, but her hitting the sand upon finding out it was a charcuterie plate. And I don't know if I could call that twerking. <laughs> I feel like it feels it. like I like twerking without the E like twerking uh, just because mm. it feels like a little bit off brand of what she was attempting to do. Again, look at Emily in the first episode. Look what happens when you get some wine and cheese into her, like completely different love. <laughs> yeah. I would react the same to uh shark. I love her. Board. I love her. She's casting perfection. Oh, yeah. 100%. Well, let's get into hopefully some moments of perfection here. Let's start with two moments from one character. I decided to see this by sort of like comparing two moments that I think kind of occupy the same wheelhouse so that we're not dealing with samey moments as the rounds go along. So we're going to start with another character in their own right from another well-regarded season. I have two moments from Wu in the Survivor Kagayan auction. They are very short moments, but let me start with this one. Fat dip with that guac. Let me replay that one more time. Get a fat dip with that guac. <laughs> so for those of you that don't remember, Jeffra had won, I believe it was like a quesadilla and some, uh, some guacamole with it. And Wu, who did not win the item, but is sort of Cat calling the quesadilla <laughs> is saying, get a fat dip of that guac. <laughs> Short, sweet, to the point. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Whoa. 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 His name is Woo. That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> well, let's move on to something. If you thought Woo uh, was salacious there, just you wait. Here is Jeff Probst offering up a plate of wit ribs to Woo. Woo bids $40 on it. And then it gets weird from there. Thank you. What do you anticipate? Oh. What's the taste? That tangy barbecue sauce, that, that chewiness of the meat. It's just, it's just immaculate all in my mouth. <laughs> Go for it. Tender. Sushi. Lathered in barbecue. Flavorful. <laughs> Easy work. Wow. That's how you do it. Yeah. Enjoy. Who's going to get woozy? Here too. Yeah, so the music was not edited in. That was rip <laughs> porn, people. Ooh. <laughs> Again, pronounce woo. I have woo. to say, I think the guac one is more disturbing. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, he has so, nothing to do with it. He's like, yeah, I guess it's, it's a little bit more voyeuristic. Yeah, like it's oh, bizarre. I mean, <laughs> I think that's more Wu's bedroom talk than the rib stuff was. Like, the rib getting... stuff, at least he's like, it's in his mouth and he's consuming it. And he's like, oh my god, it's so good. But like, he's just saying over Jeffra's shoulder, like, I want a fat dip of that guac. Like, what? I want to make that if I were to be on a social media dating profile, I would want that to be my headline. Get a fat mm. dip of that guac and see what people will respond with. Okay, so now that I've seen both, I will say Puy and I quote the first one to each other more than I'd like to admit. Okay. Like, 
Did a bad tip of that guac. So I got to go with the guac one just so. purely based on like wow. the longevity that it has instilled in, uh, and at least for us, the mm-hmm. rib one is very disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess Maggie, you said you're going to go with guac as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, wow, bit of an upset, I would say in this first matchup here. Let's let me be the lone dissenting vote because, oh my God, I did not remember the ribs moment being <laughs> as like, r-rated as mm-hmm. it is and not only that but jeff really being like the the fluffer in a manner of speaking yeah. right but being like describe yep. the taste to me and rue Ru also is probably the most risque way of describing barbecue sauce and i could think of, of like it's tangy it's sweet mm. it's like uh i guess you're all a little starved in many ways out there I also am obsessed. You talk about Liana. The quote that stuck with you is get a fat tip of that guac. The way, though, the word that has always stuck with me is the way that Rue Ru describes the ribs as immaculate, which is immaculate. one of the oddest adjective associations I've ever heard for a food item. <laughs> we, uh, the ribs yeah. are so good, it'll get you pregnant as a virgin. <laughs> what? Well, that's what I think of when I think of immaculate. Whoa. Oh, because the immaculate conception? Yeah, did, 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 do you think well, of immaculate in any other way? Yeah, the vibes were immaculate. Mm-hmm. What? No, yes. why are you not? No, why are you not? Yes. What is this I'm referring to? Uh, oh, well, Mary or Mary, Mary <laughs> Mock <laughs> rose from the dead, right? So I was yeah, Virgin Mary. <laughs> the vibes were immaculate. The vibes are. I yeah, that, that was what Jesus is writing on uh, his resurrection. Yeah, yeah that's why. Yeah. On Christmas Day, vibes were immaculate. I was disturbed by both those videos, if I'm being honest. I don't remember yeah. that happening, and I was disturbed <laughs> but deeply by both of them. I'm kind of upset. Well, this Maggie, is what you've blacked out. Let's yeah. cleanse your palate of that tangy barbecue sauce as yeah. we'll get into hopefully some better moments here. Uh, so we are going to stay, though, a bit in the saucy territory, not barbecue saucy. These are two famous bathtub moments in Survivor <gasps> Auctions. Uh, Maggie, do you want to start with your favorite or should we have it be the follow-up? We'll, we'll have it be the follow-up. Okay, so let's start with the one that actually comes before that one. So this is from the Survivor Cook Islands auction. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting because in this moment, Yule, of course, has the Tyler Perry idol in its first instance. And it gets randomly brought up at the auction, because I believe that uh, Becky bids for the power to send Candace to Exile Island, and Jeff's going to try to paint a sunny side by being like, oh, well, the idol's still there. And this information is going to get very quickly outed, leading to a very small but funny bathtub moment from future winner Poverty Shallow. It's day 29. There is still the idea of the hidden immunity idol out on Exile. I think I know where it is. I can end the suspense. I have it. You have the idol. I have the idol. Did you bring it with you? Are you uh, yeah, it's in my bag. You want to show it to us now? Sure. If you want everybody to know, we might as well just make sure. Wow. Is it right here? It's a compass on a necklace. <laughs> Looks authentic. So I, I put the entire moment in there for context, but it's pretty much just Parvati, who's in a bathtub because she won that as a reward earlier in a slice of chocolate cake, <laughs> validates the idol, pulls her own Jeff Probst moment, looks at Gule's idol and says, looks authentic. <laughs> that's actually, that's how Antiques Roadshow goes too. <laughs> looks authentic. If Antiques Roadshow <laughs> needs to get ratings, I think putting a woman in a bathtub in a bikini would probably send mm. ratings skyrocketing through the roof. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> And so, of course, this is going up against a moment that has sent Maggie into giggling fits before on this <laughs> podcast network. This is from the Survivor Gabon auction, where Susie Smith is going to bid on something very similar, uh, but she will not spend nearly enough time in the bath to authenticate any sort of advantage. A hot bath. Ah. <laughs> Everything you need to get clean. <laughs> and a clean set of your clothes. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. 320. Randy doesn't hesitate. $320. 340. 340 to Susie. I bet 100 to, to bathe her if she wins. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. 340 to Susie. Going once, going twice. 
Soul to Susie. You can count it. Okay. Oh. Oh, yay. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Ready for your next item? <laughs> I think I'm actually going to get out, guys. It's very hot. No, don't get out. What the hell are you doing, woman? This is the first bath you've had in 28 days. You done in your bath? Yep. All right. That's cuckoo. I would have been there the whole time. Next item. Yeah, we know, Sugar. Uh, yeah, so I, I removed a little bit of context there, but basically one item was between those two moments that I spliced together. She got in the bath, Maddie won a cheeseburger, and then she immediately got out. Could not have been longer than two minutes that she spent in the first bath she's had in a month. You paid so much for it. I, it's, what do you? It's, uh, but even like if it's too hot, just like sit on the side, pull a hot tub moment. You know, it's so ridiculous. Like what? Like who does that? That it's so so good. And you know, it's this is like one of my most favorite moments. In, in Survivor, like, I think that it is so absurdly ridiculous. I do think that the other bathtub moment, though, the, the thing is, like, Parvati is such an important character to Survivor as a whole. Mm. And Parvati in the bathtub, in a bikini, eating chocolate cake on her first season, I feel like is quintessential, like, Survivor Parvati. So, like, mm. I... I love Susie in the bathtub. Don't get me wrong. And I, my vote is going to go there. But, like, I understand the importance of the Parvati in the bathtub as well. I, I do think maybe Parvati in the hot tub, co mm. like, supersedes Parvati in the bathtub. But I understand the vibe. Yeah. Well, we'll rank Parvati water moments coming up yeah, in the future yeah. season. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. I, <laughs> I kind of want to... Uh, I kind of go with Susie. That's what my gut is telling me. I don't know why, but that's what I'm going to pick. Yeah, I was going to go poverty just to like demerit points from Randy for being a horny old man and being like, I'll pay $100 to watch I don't remember Susie. that part. I don't remember. Like <laughs> when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, what? Yeah, Randy doesn't even vote for her to win at the end yeah, of all gross. that. He's going to be like, so you should have let me bathe you. You should have let me pee you. <laughs> disgusting like All seriously right. disgusting well Susie is going to move on much like she does from the bath water let's move on now I think the fish eyes would probably be more of a viscerally disgusting moment than the next two that we have just because of the ASMR that was involved in the commercial break and the membranes and the like but Survivor has certainly had their fair share of dud prizes now in the past sometimes it's been like a bowl of nuts or a basket of uncooked rice in this case in Survivor history, we have two moments where Survivor contestants are gifted authentic cuisine from their local areas, and they'll take it on the chin for better and for worse. Let's start with Survivor Micronesia, where uh, James Clement will not bid on the fruit bat soup, but he will get it just because someone else does not want to have it. Let's take a look. Good. Please let it be good. Fruit bath soup. Ah, oh, wow. Not even interested. Oh. I'll eat it. You want it? Yeah. James, all yours. Take a bite of that for me. Gotta take the skin off first. That's the secret. So get past the skin. All right. Mm -hmm. Free food? No. Yeah. Perfect. All Tough. right. People said that's how COVID started. <laughs> yeah, he was James's patient zero. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess he was patient, I don't know, like negative seven because it happened so many years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was just waiting. It was incubating. Maybe that's why James was actually medevac. It was like, it wasn't about his finger. It's like, we think you may have a strain. Oh. <laughs> so that is going up against someone who actually made an appearance in like that montage that showed at the very beginning mm -hmm. of this week's auction. I feel like a forgotten character, perhaps underrated in Survivor history. Let's talk about Shannon Shambo Waters as Shambo gets the dud item in the Survivor Samoa auction and responds in only the way that Shambo could. $240 bought you a Survivor version of spaghetti. Oh, really? Sea noodles and slug guts. Oh, oh dude. To go. Yum. Thank you. With a little bit of Parmesan. 
just to bring out the flavor. Good stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> does it have, like, nutritional starch value, you know? I don't. God, I hope it does, because my body is really deprived. Let's just say it does. All right, Shamba. Thank you. Enjoy. Not Shambo reading the back of the box on the sea noodle. Yes, we love a macro queen. <laughs> have, like, I love nutritional that... starch value. I love that she no souls it. I think that's my favorite part, right? Because obviously they want that reaction. You know, you uncover uh -huh. it, you go, oh, like, oh, like, oh, I don't want to eat this. And she, <laughs> she was just like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I love that. Uh, mm. uh, I think I'm gonna have to. I will give it to James and the bat soup. Uh, I know that we try to talk about these out of context, but I love that it calls back to a scene from maybe it was the merge feast where like they were given a bunch of stuff and then there was fruit bats in the corner and like mm -hmm. nobody ate it except for James. I love that it came back and James is like, ooh, seconds, yummy, yummy. And the fact that he gave advice to Jeff Probst as to how to eat it, like he's been living in Micronesia for all of his life, I think is such a fun, small moment for a great character in Survivor. I mean, the bat suit was soup was referenced on this episode that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Like Emily said, I'm worried that this is going to be bat soup. And I don't mean to squeal and be like squeamish about a local delicacy. Like just I, I want to say that. Like I know it's a local delicacy, delicacy in Micronesia. It was just the zoom in on the face that was tough for me. Like the, the zoom in on the bat's face is what made me feel then a lot of feelings. But um, yeah, I mean, bat soup is iconic. It's the iconic gross food item of of the auction, I feel. Okay, I'm gonna give my I'm gonna give my vote to Shambo, but I'm happy with Bat Soup <laughs> moving on. I think it's the correct decision, but that moment I had completely forgotten about and mm -hmm. it's so funny to me. And I love Jeff just looking at her being like, I sure. I don't know what am I Shambo. To do with you. Like yeah. Shambo is such a good survivor character. She She's is so great. Mwah. Up here. Love. Yeah, I, I maybe uh, I'll do a podcast with Nigel and Kevin in the future about how great Shambo is. Uh, one of like the top ten things about her is that for some reason half the cast calls her Shambo. <laughs> That's where she. I mean, it's a B and B. Also, we got to give some love to Shambo. So, oh yeah, one hundred percent. All right, well, let's get into two moments where people were not seen in the brightest of lights in Survivor auctions. Let's start with a moment from the Survivor token sheens auction where we talk about well-regarded characters i would say debbie bb maybe not like the most well-remembered person from survivor token sheens she has her moments here is one of them a bowl of french fries 40 bucks 40 to taj 50 20 dollar increments uh 70 <laughs> 20 dollars you're a principal not a math teacher it's okay my math teachers will tell you that too <laughs> whatever i want to go up on taj <laughs> So Debbie can't oh, do math. Sweet Lord. Sweet Lord. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Stop. As She wants to go up on Taj, but let's see if she's going up against this clip. I mean, when we talk about people doing not so bright things, of course, Kat Ederson has to be in the conversation. And here is the epiphany that she came to on the Survivor One World auction. Tea, chips, and a cold oh. iced tea. Oh, Start the bidding. 40. 100. 100 to Kat. 160. 180. 180 to cat. Going once. Going twice. Wow. Sold to cat. $180. Nice. Yo, there's bacon on there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say there's bacon and he clearly said that was a BLG? I know. <laughs> There we go. So it's Debbie can't count by 20s versus Cat does not know what B stands for in a BLT. <laughs> I wonder what she thought it stood for. I bet she didn't even think about it. Yeah. Probably like breast. She just saw sandwich. Breast. Uh -huh. a breast. Well, considering what she ends up doing uh, in the last time we see her on Survivor. <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it. I, I think like... it has. It, it goes to cat for me. I think just because not even with the dude, there's bacon in this, but the fact that like Sabrina is completely being the stray man here and being like, did she really just say that? And cat, meanwhile, is in her own little world going like, uh, 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 like she's doing her own celebratory dance, not realizing how stupid she was. I'll agree with Mike. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, my gut was saying 70 bucks is an increment of 20 just because I like the math of it all. So I'm going to end up going there, but I do think that cat moving on is that's, I think that's the right. No, answer. that's a, that's a really good one. And that's the rare, like double joke where it's okay. Yes. You know, it's 40 and yes. then she goes to 50 and then Jeff goes increments of 20 and Debbie goes 70. <laughs> 70. Exactly. Yes. I think that's probably why I like it so much is because it's not just the 50 increments of 20. Oh, okay. 80. Right. <laughs> it's like increments of 20. Oh, 70. <laughs> yeah. because it's 20 on 50 right like yeah. you can see the logic of like trying to add 20 dollars. it's just that's not what he was saying all um, right let's go into it's been a while since we've been uh traipsing into the r-rated content here when it comes to our auction moments let's dip I mean, back into those dirty we... waters watch those ribs that was r-rated content as far as well yeah let's get back in that and we'll go biblical again talk about immaculate uh maybe that's why will maybe it was like a man of god mm. so much that he's like i feel like adam and eve at this point immaculate uh let's go to the good book of micronesia again this category is two moments where for some reason contestants mm -hmm. licked food off of other contestants fingers mm -hmm. We have watched Sari Fields play nearly 100 Days of Big Brother this past summer. And still, she probably enjoyed it a lot more than what Eric does to her in this clip. <laughs> it starts now. Go, go. go. Mm. Mm. I'll give them 20 bucks each to lick their fingers when they're done. No. Eric. Yeah. How much you say? You know what I'm I'd say twenty bucks to lick your fingers. Twenty to finger? All right. How about how about how about forty bucks to lick your fingers? Mm. He's serious. Okay. Mhm. Mm oh baby. Oh baby. Mm. Oh that's sad. Oh, God, I mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Something's wrong with that boy. <laughs> he really has problems, poor thing. The Survivor auction is <laughs> over. And so is Eric's virginity. <laughs> Uh, the James commentary is what makes oh, that for me. Oh, that's just so nasty. Good. <laughs> he needs so help. Like, so funny. There are oh. so many moments that I forgot about this. And no offense to what's coming next, but like, this is going to be at handle, I think, in my opinion. Like, Eric, for some reason, deciding to say, oh, baby, before diving in. <laughs> like, try to make this moment even more awkward, and he accomplishes that task. Uh, I, it's... Uh, it's amazing. It's it's mm -hmm. survivor perfection. And Suri, like Suri being the one to do it also makes it like really fun because, mm -hmm. you know, if it was like Natalie or someone who had been sort of sexually expressive throughout the season, mm -hmm. I do think mm -hmm. that it would have made it different. But because of the dynamic of like Suri being like this, like sweet, you know, like more stoic figure and like her being like, sure, you can lick my fingers and Eric just going. <laughs> so good but also like eric maybe this was a, a sign of what was to come that eric's like oh i want to pay 20 dollars to lick your finger suri says oh what did you say 20 dollars took my finger and he goes okay 40 i see you drive <laughs> yeah. a hard bargain like no that was not the intention at all uh -huh, so good i think she was trying to say like per finger like 20 dollars mm. per finger and then he countered with 40 i thought for, she like, was just asking a clarification of like hey what did you say five uh, days ago it's like oh you drive a hard bargain okay 40 dollars. So i'd love to see so him good. negotiate for something else <laughs> yeah imagine like okay here's the rice negotiation jeff we will all sit out for rice which hold mm -hmm. on wait sorry the knife how do we, we how have do we go to talk, about, without the talking knife. about the knife oh brilliant brilliant jeff probst more of that more of that that was brilliant my favorite part of the whole episode like in what universe could you travel back in time and explain at one point in a season of survivor jeff probst will threaten a group of castaways by brandishing a knife and stabbing a bag of rice if you watched so him good. if you watched him in survivor australia i would have said yeah next season like this <laughs> old school jeff all the way perfect yeah. so good i've never been sexually attracted to jeff probst but in <gasps> that moment i was like oh if i okay. wish i were that knife <laughs> you you've never been sexually attracted to jeff probst he, no not really my type not really my type even with the bacon tray thing mm. the whole, like not 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 really my vibe um but the the slicing with the knife mm, that did it's it for so me. funny watching these old <laughs> clips from old seasons i'm like oh 
Jeff. Jeff can get it. Jeff, I just Jeff, Jeff. I love it so much because Jeff immediately took things to 10. He brought a knife to a rice fight where he's like, like he brought it expecting it to happen. Then he's like, oh, that was, so bad. <laughs> that was the best part. It was out of nowhere. It was like, oh, we're going to do the rice negotiation. He's like, we're going to make this more intense. Like just immediately, like out of, so it felt bad. like completely out of nowhere. It happened so fast. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see like the panic of everybody. just the whole thing. That was an outstanding decision. Mm -hmm. A plus, yeah. A plus, plus, I plus. adore it. The fact that, these people are like, we've seen 43 and 44. We know how to do hard Paul. Jeff's like, no, you don't. I'm going to mortally <laughs> wound your rice. You have 10 seconds. Good luck. And that's like, yeah. th let's just say even further. I know we talked about this last season. This is not a negotiation whatsoever. This mm -hmm. is you like not only taking a hostage, but shooting it in the leg and oh, being yeah. like, here you go. <laughs> Like, we're going to see Wharton Business School being like, ah, new negotiation <laughs> tactic. Crazy. Oh, so, so good. good. Yeah. Uh, it was just so, just, just the idea that he pulled out a knife. And also, and I adore this cast because of the way they banter with Jeff Probst and Kendra calling out his, like, sickening face, including at Tribal Council, was so good. Amazing. So yeah, and you're right, Liana. The swift, quick way he did it, just like a total badass. It's like the, it's it's the equivalent of like the guy in the movie blowing something up and like walking away and not turning yeah, around. Not it was like it. Jeff's like boom. Good luck to yeah. It was so good. Mm -hmm. Sorry for you. Sorry, Sorry for, for you, you rice bag. <laughs> the losers. All right. Well, uh, let's move on. Maybe that was a nice little like uh, sorbet between courses of licking fingers as we go from Eric's first season to his second season, wherever he seems to be, finger licking tends to follow. And even though he was not a part of this one, he was certainly nearby as we go to the second fans versus favorites season. Let's talk about the eventual winner of said season in John Cochran. Now. Oh my God. I'll scoop up stuff at the end. Oh, wow. that? Cochran, how often does that happen? More often than you think. And the Survivor auction is over. It's finger looking good. <laughs> but the thing, so the thing is, like, Eric's, like, I kind of believe Cochran. Like, Eric is kind of coming from this from the angle of, like, I don't know what I'm doing. How much do I pay you? That type of idea. Cochran, the way he really figures his mouth around the finger and the way he like pulls it around the curve with panache seems to tell me like this is a notch in the bedpost in a manner of speaking. <laughs> I mean, plus I'm sure Jeff thinks it happens never. So the fact more often than you think could just mean once. <laughs> <laughs> One is greater than zero. Boom. Hey, Max. John Cochran, call me. <laughs> no Cochran's I mean, a total survivor crush of mine which i when i watched it with lincoln i was like i have such a crush on him lincoln was like really he's like sunburned from head to toe but his confessional about it was so charming and adorable i was mm -hmm. like i love this guy he's great <laughs> you and jeff love yeah, Cochran. Me, yeah. <laughs> jeff Oh my Cochran. god, what a menage if I've ever heard yeah. of one before. <laughs> my, all my about Survivor all crushes licking. popping out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get the chocolate and peanut butter out. Uh, right? Okay, well, I mean, look, I gotta go with Eric here uh, for my I mean, ultimate decision, though. Yeah, it, it has to go with, with Eric. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it'll certainly be a contender to win, I think, mm -hmm. down the line. Let's get into uh, a couple of outlandish moments i would say at these auctions these are a bit more of a mismatch these last couple but they're so infamous that they kind of just had to be put against each other let's go all the way back to our earliest moment now it's not from the first survivor auction but it is the second we're going of course to survivor africa big tom and ethan zahn who recently celebrated his 50th birthday go in together on whatever is underneath the cloche and what's underneath it emits a quote that has to be remembered through the annals of Survivor history. Open that baby up. He did me wrong. I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. After I kiss you. Ham, <laughs> 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 he's a Jew and he won't eat the ham. He's a Jew. 
Oh, 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 man. Big Tom, wait, Big Tom, come here. Oh. Come here. Whoa, be careful, baby. I just want to see you enjoy this. You won't need that anymore. Oh, my God. Thank you. It's all right. Half that meal that he just split with you, he's not going to eat. Oh, he won't eat that. I mean, I hate it for him. I hate it for him. I, I wish he would. Probably, in my opinion, maybe the most iconic Big Tom moment in the show's history mm -hmm. for him. It's he's a Jew. He won't eat the ham. He's a Jew. That's uh, it's so funny. That's when I think of the like. I think if someone were to ask me, like, n list moments from Survivor auctions, this is definitely one that's popping into my brain organically. Just because, I mean, one, it's like in the early seasons of Survivor, right? It feels a little bit more formative. But just his re, like Big Tom's reaction is really what does it for me here. Yeah, I I mean, wow, we're just playing videos of my survivor crushes. Ethan's reaction. Oh, just a big Tom? Like, no, 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 no. Everyone no, got room Ethan, for a fourth? Ethan's reaction, I think, makes it okay for us as the audience because Ethan is laughing with him. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, then suddenly mm. in the audience, when you're like, what is he? Like, oh, yeah, take it out like, of context, oh, especially yeah. in 2023. Oof, I do Yeah, that, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's counteract with something completely different here. And maybe we're talking about uh, someone else, a Southern man who is withholding items from others. This was uh, a defining moment for Mike Holloway in Survivor Worlds Apart, but not in a good way so at the auction of survivor worlds apart the auction that people figured was broken and would make the uh entire aspect of it never return again shireen basically broke it by saying okay if we all bid on 20 dollars, <laughs> we can all get our letters from home now what's interesting was that there were several people namely carolyn dan and mike holloway who had been holding on to all of their money 500 dollars for an advantage, knowing that one had come up in Survivor San Juan del Sur. And so everyone agreed, okay, let's put in $20 so we all get our letters, and then that way, Dan, Mama C, Mike, will all put in $480, we'll all do a rock draw to figure out who gets the advantage. And this is how like uh, much time has passed in the 8.5 years. Not only has an entire marriage happened between Liana and Puya, the last time this happened, Dan Foley got an extra vote as the advantage, which was like the first non-idol advantage in the show's history to the wow. point where it was just referred to as an advantage. It was not even called anything. That's yeah. how long wow. ago it was. But even before we get to that, as everyone starts putting in their money and getting their letters, Mike gets a little bit of cold feet. Let's take a look. Else who wants to buy their loved one letters from home for $20 can do so which puts Dan, Carolyn, and Mike in an interesting position. It. Let's all do it for $20, and then we fa fight for the advantage fair and square with 480. Who's in? Please. Mike, Who wants in? it? Guys, everyone's in for 20? Let's go. It's fair. Let's go. get it, you guys. Yay! All right, find your note. I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna I'm, trick you I'm guys. Go, man. please. Go, please. I'm not gonna. Why would I displace trust? Go. Mike, did you get? He didn't do it. Wow. That's bull. I'll give it back. So much for your trust, Mike. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. That wouldn't go with my conscience. That's not, that goes against who I am as a person. Yeah, so while this is probably going to be the least funny moment we're talking about in this, incredibly impactful, because if you remember your world apart well, which it's understandable if you wouldn't, you block that from memory, this was really something that turned everybody in the game against Mike. Even though Mike doesn't go at this vote, it makes him pretty much public enemy number one from here on out, where he had to win out and play his idol to make it to the final three. <laughs> I didn't watch this season, but that was thrilling. Oh! <laughs> no, um, I, I haven't seen that one. So I, I'm like, Mike's kind of smart. I don't know. I, I, I don't have full context. 
post. So I don't want to say something that like, you know, sounds like everybody was very upset, but that's an exciting, exciting moment. I, uh, I very much enjoy his hair in this clip as well. I don't remember it being so chia petty. Yeah. In the like the 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 up the upness of it all, but honestly, if he had stuck with it, it's kind of a badass move. I feel yeah. like Carolyn should not have gone back and been able to trade back. It should have been like, look, you 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 broke it, you bought it, or whatever, you know, the, not that, but you know what I'm saying? So uh I mean she didn't open it, cool. so she could I don't know what the return policy is on love. Exactly, that's letters. what I'm saying. It's like by all sales are final of the survivor auction. Yeah, so this one's tough because I really do adore he's a Jew, he won't eat the ham. And like you said, Liana, such a great representation of like the old school auction. But this is one of those rare auction moments that like actually made an impact on the rest of the season. So I'm really between a rock and a hard stone here. Liana, who are you going with? Um, I mean, I'm going to go with Survivor Africa. <laughs> I just, like Ethan's reaction is so funny to me too. That's what I got to go with. What do you think, Maggie? Um, oh gosh, I think I have to abstain from this one since I haven't seen uh Worlds Apart. Is that what I like? Mm -hmm. I, I think I have yeah. to abstain because I don't have it contextually. It was really thrilling to watch, honestly. I'm like, maybe I should watch the season or maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. You it said people forget it for a reason. Um, but I'm I I was really entertained by that clip. Like it, it was very tense and exciting. Well, listen. So I'm gonna abstain. Sorry. How about this? Shireen, once upon a time, broke the auction. Why don't I? If I vote for Mike, could we push both of them through to the next round? Because I did have seven sure. categories, and then so oh, then we'll have yeah. so we'll we'll have you know uh, another we'll have four matchups going on next time. So they both Perfect. make it through. But we don't have we don't have. Are, are we all done with the initial matchups? No, we got one oh, okay. more left. Okay. And maybe we could have saved the push through a bolt to this next one because these are two big, big moments in the auction. Let's go. Let's start with, uh, I'd say these are two sweet moments in more ways than one. Mm. Let's start with the more emotionally sweet Survivor token sheens. Eddie George, you know the rest. See you back in the camp. There's one line on there. Might have been a little hard to hear. There's one line. Tosh kind of like uh, assaulted Jeff the way he assaulted that rice bag. I love it. <laughs> so bad. So bad. Now, now, of course, by process of elimination, you have to imagine yeah. what it's going up against. And it's mm -hmm. sad to do so. But we are going from emotionally sweet too literally sweet. Jeff, give Randy Bailey some cookies. Bucks buys this for the tribe. Funny. Sold to Randy. He was quick. Thank you, Randy. You bought this for the tribe. How sweet, Randy. You just made a lot of people very happy. Oh, I can have them all myself if I want. For the tribe. Okay. For Randy. Who wants one? Would you like one? I don't sure. want Thank you. I could sure? possibly. Would you like one? Sure. Randy, this is so Thank awesome. You. Thank you. You sure, Sugar? Maddie's Sugar? getting it. Yeah. It's, it's not yours to give to Maddie. I'm the boss. You're going to have two if you'd like. Oh, I'll take one and a half. Can I do that? Sure. So, Randy, you're giving part of Sugar's to Corinne? Uh, Sugar doesn't have one. I offered her one, and she didn't take one. Thank so, you. they're mine. You want a half? Go for it. Thank you. Last chance, you can have a full one. Thank you. Randy offers Sugar his own cookie. She takes it and gives it to Maddie. Yeah. Would you like to repeat that? Wow. I think it worked out the way it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, this is, when I thought we were moving on from first round, I was like, where's Gabon cookies? Where are the Gabon cookies? Get those cookies. And I will say, like, you know, you're talking about how in the last clip with Mike Holloway, it, like, really affected the season. This also deeply affected the season. Like, this was the sticking point. This is why Sugar is laughing when Randy uses the fake idol. Like this In, in this very episode. Thing, yeah, this mm -hmm. cookie thing is so outsized and 
insane and they are both so petty to the point that jeff doesn't even have a rebuttal he's just like it worked out the way it worked out. and i love randy sassing jeff right there uh are you, can you repeat yeah. yourself please i mm -hmm. uh, just need the recap of the fact that sugar openly insulted me yeah mm -hmm. exactly Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i'm gonna go with the cookies as well although taja's reaction like the the order of operations of her reaction always is very funny to me because like she clearly processed it but like is so overwhelmed with emotion which yeah. is great but yeah the cookie moment for me yeah i i don't want to like put something you know fun and you know mean over something that's so emotionally sweet but at the same time like the cookies is just so iconic to both randy and sugar and their relationship mm -hmm. with each other also the fact that sugar is the one giving up cookies i think is a fun irony in and of itself uh the taj one does get some extra credit because if i don't know if you remember at the end of the auction they do like a slow motion clip and the slow motion clip they played was of taj shaking jeff nearly dislocating his shoulder as a reminder of just her <laughs> freaking out that Eddie George saw them back at the camp. Mm -hmm. Love. All right. Now we've seen all the clips. Let's go into round two here. So we'll, we'll go a little bit faster on this one. Maggie, Susie getting out of the bath in Gabon versus get a fat dip of that guac. I am going to have to go with Susie coming out of the bath. I mean, it's to me iconic forever. So that's what I'm going with. All right, Liana, what about you? <laughs> I'm going with woo. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm going to go with woo as well, just because I'm thinking like what represents the auction more. And to me, woo, like wishing that he was that guac or the quesadilla in wow. that moment, I think represents the hunger that they're feeling. And also like, you know, the fact that he got two moments and only one can make it through. I think one has to survive here. So guac, mm -hmm makes it through next round liana james eats the bat soup versus cat doesn't know what a blt is i gotta go with bat soup i agree me too yeah mm -hmm. right. it's just it's also again if we're thinking about something that's really like encapsulates the auction it's the bat soup yeah all right next up eric licking chocolate cake off of Cerise's fingers versus he's a jew he won't eat the ham I, I have to go with Eric here as well. I love the Big Tom moment, but there is so much. Like, the Big Tom clip is funny. I love when we forget about, like, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, after I kiss you. Uh, but everything from, again, Eric's lack of negotiation skills to, again, for some strange reason, him saying, oh, baby, before he deep throats Cerise's fingers, to especially James's color commentary. Like, it is a perfect <laughs> clip, in my opinion. So it has to move yes. on here. Mm -hmm. I agree. Unanimous decision. All right. Final one. Uh, so we have Mike's loved one letter purchase, <laughs> which came in through the double buy-in from last round, versus the recently mentioned Randy and the cookies. I'm going to go with Randy's cookies. I, I maybe I should also abstain. Well. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> Mike and I are on the same page. So yeah, okay. okay. We'll go with that. Randy and the cookies. Yes. Okay. So. We are at the Ooh. final four right <laughs> now. Okay. All right. Uh let's do let's let's jumble up the matchups a little bit. Liana, get a fat dip of that guac versus Randy and the cookies. We got a fat dip of that guac. <laughs> Oh, I'm voting Randy and the cookies. Me too. Me too. <laughs> the guac can only get you so far. I know, Liana, that it's uh, underneath your house crest, but yes, unfortunately, it, it really dies is. the final four. <laughs> and then Bat Soup versus actually two moments from the Micronesia auction. Bat Soup versus Ooh. Eric licking Suri's fingers. I'm going with the finger licking. Yeah, I got to go with the finger licking as well. Same. Again, for all the reasons you mentioned last round, but especially James's commentary. Like, that's yeah. really for me what pushes something it to wrong. The top here. Something wrong with that boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we are. Okay. Two dessert related auction moments <laughs> from seasons that came right after one another. The year mm. 2008 was a great time to be a Survivor fan. If you loved auction moments, we have Eric paying to lick Sari Field's fingers <laughs> versus Randy attempting to give cookies to everyone in the tribe, Sugar taking one out of spite only to give it a, to take Randy's cookie, giving it away to someone else. This is the final matchup, the be-all, end-all. Maggie, who is winning your vote? <sighs> 
I'm so sorry, but my giggle after you said Eric paying to lick Ceri's fingers. That's a real sentence. That is a real sentence. And that is getting my vote. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's not only what Survivor Auction, but the freaking B&B is all about, baby. Yeah, yeah. baby. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to lie, Mike. When we went through that next round and I was reminded of that, I was like, oh, this is probably going to be my winner pick. Like, I will yeah. do my best to push this through. And it is my honor to vote for it in the finals. <laughs> Yeah, I have to make it three for three. Again, there's just so much great stuff yes. contained in there. I think it really represents the auction as well, that people are so starving. They are paying. Cont That's the other thing, is that in the auction, you are usually paying Jeff Probst money. Sari pocketed $40 of, of money to take home because this weird-ass mop-headed ice cream scooper decided... I want to lick chocolate cake off this woman's fingers. Eric paid to lick Cerise's fingers. <laughs> we so froze good. Mike Bloom. I we know. That's Mike it. Bloom. You did. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, Mike's internet probably died. He's been having some technical issues. So, um, well, that's our winner. <laughs> and I think a rightful winner for all of the yes. reasons that we've mentioned, especially Mog's reaction here of just absolutely losing it, I think is a telltale sign that this is our correct winner for the auction. That's so so let's, uh, let's close things out here. So Maggie is there. We love at the end of the b, &B to give our guests the opportunity to plug something that's important to them, a charity or cause or otherwise. So Maggie, what would you like to talk about today? Yeah, I've talked about this. I think every time I've been on the b, &B I want to talk about Planned Parenthood. Um, it supports... Uh, women's health everywhere in the country and um, especially in with what's been going on in the world over the past uh, or what's been going on in the United States over the past couple of years. Um, it's a really, really important organization. Um, and so I would love it if people would be directed there after the episode. Yes. And uh, yes, also a cause very near and dear to my heart as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maggie. And this was so fun to have you on the b, &B. We always love having you here. Uh, and especially- Feels like home. Not everything for the Austin. Exactly. I know. Mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a platinum member here. That's your <gasps> card. <laughs> I'm so honored. I love it. Thank you so much for saying that. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> all right, Maggie. Well, is there anything else you want to plug uh, before we get out of here? Social media, all that jazz. Yeah. Um, right now, obviously, it's Big Brother off season, so I'm taking a little break. We don't have um, my Hot Dummies on Island show, Temptation Island, going on. So um, everything's pretty chill here. You can find me on Instagram, threads, and TikTok at MLMorgan underscore if you want to chat. Um, that's where I'll be. Okay, fantastic. And you can find me uh, on Twitter at Liana R H A P. Right now, I'm mostly just keeping it down with the BMB &B and then Mass Singer with Puya. We're talking about everything from that season, which we're not going to have an episode next week because of Thanksgiving, but we will be back two weeks after that. And then Marisa and I, my sister, uh, which if you're interested in her fantastic artwork, <laughs> um, you, you can tune into our Mass Singer or our Lego Masters podcast. So we're going to be covering the last batch of episodes after the finale airs. So Mike, we already did our plugs. We're closing okay. things out. I'm sorry. Randy uh, was at the door asking for cookie <laughs> donations. And then he started yelling at me when I didn't have any. I said, can I offer you my tube of fun? He slammed the door in my face. So I was dealing with that <laughs> medical malady. No more uh, buttons. No. So you can catch up with everything I'm doing. Of course, I got the pleasure of talking with Kelly this week. It was a sad state of affairs, but still a great one to have. Definitely putting the sweet in bittersweet. People were saying it was one of the best interviews of the season. I think she shed a lot of light as to her own mode of thinking, how she thinks she got into this place. Looking back, how she regrets not throwing a challenge in the pre-merge. So lots of really interesting discussion with, again, one of the biggest narrators we've had of the season so far. And of course, talking Amazing Race. Maggie, I know you've been loving this season as well. Loving it. And I would love to chat anytime you want me. So I, I'm, I'm putting in my, ha my hat in the ring there, too. All right. Well, I have some fingers with cake covered in them. So uh, <laughs> let's see when the money starts flying for that as well. Whoa. Whoa.
Well, uh, again, I am not an ice cream scooper. Again, it's pronounced woo for the last time. Uh, well, hopefully you all were saying woo to this podcast. This was so much fun. Next week, Ali Lasher joins Liana and I to recap episode nine. Let's see what happens. Will it be a pagonging? As Maggie forecasts, we shall see. Thank you again so much for listening. Special thanks to Scott St. Pierre and the RHAP team for editing everything behind the scenes. And Wolf of America for his fantastic theme song. Until next week, everybody. We'll check you out at your next stay. <laughs>